Hello and welcome to TidyX episode 42. It's TidyX is a screencast where we go through and explain how our code works. My name is Ellis Hughes. You can find me on Twitter at, at Ellis underscore Hughes. And I'm Patrick Ward. You can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick. And you can find the screencast on Twitter at, at Tidy underscore explained. Or you can drop us an email, tidy.explained at gmail.com. Or comment on the YouTube channel. Either way, we'd love to hear Twitter. from you. Hit us on Twitter. Uh, either way, we'd love to, to hear from you, get your ideas, thoughts, things that you might like to see, things that might be helpful, uh, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> All right. Well, this week's Teddy Tuesday, or the, this week's episode is going to be on a submission from uh, the Tidy Tuesday project. Uh, the data set for Tidy Tuesday this week was the Big Mac Index. So it's purchasing parity between countries on how much a Big Mac costs. So, which I think is kind of, a, like, you know, you got the, a standard commodity, but there's so much price, like, differentiation across yeah. different countries. I think it's a very interesting way to look at, the, um, you know, economics, I guess. Yeah. Not, not yeah. that I have any experience with economics, but. Definitely. Yeah, <laughs> me either. But which I thought it was, uh, I had to do a double take when I started kind of perusing um, Twitter to see that the you know, the figures and the visualizations that people are posting. Cause I was like, is this like Big Mac as in like Big Mac, like Big Mac? Or like, I don't know, Freddie uh, Mac. Yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> like so I had, I had to kind of, uh, exactly. I had to kind of look. What, one thing I am kind of surprised in the visuals that people produced this week, and there were a lot of nice ones, but what I'm, I am surprised is nobody worked in like a, um, like an image of Ronald McDonald and like, you know, Hamburglar and those and, and like Grimace. Like I thought for sure someone would get it on the plot somehow. Nobody did. So well, that's you know, use that. What was it? Magic, the magic package to, uh, to add images. It, onto so, other yeah, images. exactly. Yeah, they, so. they were more, um, more, the plots were more, I think kind of your traditional economics type plots, like change over time, rate of change over time, uh, which brings us to our plot yes, from this exactly. week. Right. Yeah, so uh, data viz guy one six four eight or uh, Peter, uh, very uh, more shared, commonly known. <laughs> more commonly known, uh, has shared this this image on Twitter, and we thought that it was a pretty nice image. Here, I'll blow it up for y'all so you can see it a little bit more clearly. Here, uh, Patrick, you want to take us through why you think this is a cool plot? Uh, we've done something like this in the past, uh, where we've kind of had. Um, the sort of, I don't want to say not as interesting countries, but the, the countries that were not interested in highlighting kind of sitting there in gray in the background and then using color to kind of make the other groups uh, pop. I think the last time we did this might have been early on on marble races. I believe it was the bump plots that we, we did something uh, like this. On. Was it, bump was, it, was, it, it was, was the marble races? It was one of those. It well, was a maybe, line plot. I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we'll have to. Yeah. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll have to link. find it. Yeah. yeah. Add a link in the so, description. But So, yeah, so we've done something like that. So um, I, what I like about this, um, obviously, it's showing, uh, you know, d dollar prices in, in U.S. dollars. Um, so every country's, uh, I guess, Big Mac price is scaled to U.S. dollars for the plot. Uh, and it's showing it over time since 2000 up until present. And um, well, one, I like the use of colors. Obviously, he has the McDonald's colors uh, kind of popping out there. I like the use of gray for the, um, the countries that were not interested. So he's highlighting top five, bottom five, top five, bottom five, I, I believe is what it was. Um, yep. I like the use of the grid lines. So instead of getting rid of grid lines altogether, he gave it some context by keeping the grid lines, but customizing them in a bit of, uh, so the, the uh, major axes uh, lines are in kind of that yellow dash. So I really like that. So it's a plot that incorporates a lot of information. And then in store, instead of cluttering it up with a legend or anything like that, he uses the actual country names um, at the end line, uh, which is also a really cool way to kind of show the plot. It's exactly. something that you'd probably see in New York Times or The Economist or something like that, you know, pretty cool. Where yeah, they do some pretty cool, pretty good vids, yeah. I hear. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so Peter, uh, we reached out to Peter, asked him if we could uh, share his code. He said, or uh, go through, talk through his plot. He said, absolutely, shared the code. So his code is now on GitHub, which is available here. And so we took this and took it into our R console, which we will now be going through and explaining. Yay. All right. So this is Peter's code. 
So at the very beginning, he's bringing in Tidyverse and a package I've never actually used before, Direct Labels. I've never, uh, and I, I, I'm not even sure where he uses it, so I don't know what it, I'm not sure what it's doing. Um, uh, add Direct Labels to a plot, add color, or in Hide Color Legend. Directly, so he must, direct in label. his bottom, in the plot, he must have something called Direct, doesn't look like oh, it. Okay. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. All right. Maybe he intended he, to use he figured it. Out, he figured out how to do it without it using the base yeah. stuff, which or yeah, base, base quote ggplot, which is awesome. That's really creative. Yeah, that there thing. you go. All right. So use Tidy Tuesday R package to load in the data using the the uh, ISO uh, date there. So now Tuesday data. He's now extracting the data out of the Tuesday data object. Oh, it's a data. How many times can I say data in, in a sentence? So we've got the the map. <laughs> uh, I'll I'll say not as many times as NFL um, commentators can say the analytics. Analytics, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the analytics that say to do this. We're we're yeah. only listening to analytics right now. This this is an analytics podcast screencast. Whatever we are. <laughs> exactly. Cool. All right. So then he hops in to do um, some. A little bit of data exploration. Pat, you want to take us through this one? Yep. So, uh, like I said on the plot, he kind of highlighted the top five and top bo- blah, top five and bottom five. So his first kind of move was, let me just see what's there. So filtering um, every filtering the date equal to twenty twenty seven one. So that must be, I'm guessing, the last date in the data set. I'm sure he wanted to know on the last date that the Big Mac index was taken. Um, just give me the, the date, the name of the country, and the dollar price of the Big Mac. I'm guessing that's the U.S. dollars, and um, he's just snagging the top five, uh, top five countries, right? Yep, using the top N. Top N, right. Top N function. He could have arranged and used head five, head five, same type of thing, but yeah. And then um, he's doing the inverse here, so he's taking the bottom N by use of the negative five inside of the top end function. And so there we see um, if you are a person who likes Big Macs, South Africa is the place to be. You can, you can get a lot pick of up a Big Mac for a dollar eighty six. Yeah. Sounds like a deal. Sounds like a deal. Brewing up some deals. All right. So now he's got the um, an idea of what the top five and the bottom five countries are. That'll inform later on for the plots. But first, he wants to go through and figure out. Okay, so I've got a. I'm going to be able to identify the top and bottom five. But how do I go through and identify when it's not that case? Um, and so there's a couple different ways you can do it. He actually created uh, what you'd call an infix operator. I believe it's called an infix operator. And so we use them all the time. It's that's an infix operator. I believe this is one. That's one. So it's just functions that we're calling that you don't actually have to declare that you're using a function. So like if you use in, that's an, like, you've now used it. You've now, and so what he wants to do is he wants to create a version of this in operator here, which if you don't know how in works, you pass a vector, one, two, three, four, five. And I wanna identify which cases are in this other vector that I have, one and five. So this will now return so it'll look at this vector here and go, okay, which values in here are also found in this one? And then return a vector, uh, a Boolean vector of two and false. Yeah, and you use this a lot in uh, Tidyverse when we do filters. So if you yes. wanted to filter out only the one and the five, you'd filter your vector in one and five. So, yeah, there you go. Oop. Yeah, so that'd be how you'd use it in Tidyverse because exactly. you can't use multiple values if you use the equals equals. Yeah, um, you need it to, yeah. Operator. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. this is an in, it allows you to kind of expand your uh, equivalency search. And then staying there, if you were in tidyverse and you had your vector and you wanted to do not in, you would give it a little exclamation point right there. And so he's basically just creating his own uh, way of doing this, his own little function of doing exactly that. Yeah, exactly. So what he's doing is uh, just kind of, because this, like when you read this, you have to think about it for a second. You're like, okay, I, I'm taking the inverse of this next statement, mm. right? And so this is kind of cool because now you can just read it and go, okay, in vec where it's not this. It's kind of yeah. like a set diff. Yeah. 
Um, but a set diff returns the actual values. Here it's going to return a Boolean that's the inverse values. <laughs> and so he's creating an infix operator here. Um, this is how he's calling the in, and then he's inverting it with the exclamation point. Sorry if that's clear as mud. Uh, it can be a little bit funky to, to explain how you set these things up. But all right, so now he's going to go through and create the plot. Uh, so he's going to initially do some data manipulation um, to set up for the actual viz. He takes Mac, the Mac data set, uh, filters or selects only the columns date, name, and dollar prices, which uh, funnily enough were what we looked at earlier. And then he uses a, a mutate and throws it into a case web. So he's going to be using this later on to tell the plot, the viz, or the, the visualization, the colors that he want to be using. Um, but he calls this new, call, uh, new field top underscore bottom. And cases where name is in Switzerland, Lebanon, Norway, Sweden, US, it's labeled as now top five. So this is, um, this, these were the top five countries that he identified earlier. The next piece is what the name is in Mexico, Russia, Turkey, Ukraine, or South Africa, label it as bottom five. So that is from the, the um, prior step as well. But now he's going to use his new in, infix operator, the uh, percent exclamation point in percent. And so if it's not one of these top five countries or bottom five countries, label it as other. Mm. Um, so this is a good way to do it. Uh, you could also, uh, if you wanted to not create your own infix operator, as we said, you can do this and you'll achieve the same goal. Um, but typing this all again can be a little complicated. You're probably gonna use copy and paste. There can be copy and paste errors. So what you could also do is just use true. And that is equivalent to this because what he's doing or what, what, what they're doing is they are, okay, any of the top five label is top, top five. If it's one of the bottom five label, it is bottom five. Yeah. In this situation, it looked like Peter wanted to label all the other countries as other. And you can use that infix operator to clearly define that. Or what you could do is use this true. And now for any other cases, it'll return it other. So it's just a simpler way to write this. Uh, it's just a little trick that we've, we've picked up over time. Uh, all right, I'm trying to get rid of all my old stuff. All right, so now we've got the data set prepped. We're gonna jump into the viz. Start with ggplot. The main viz is a gg line, so, or geom line, so we're gonna use geom line. We're setting the aesthetic to where the x-axis is date, y-axis is dollar price. You're gonna group by name. This mean this way the plot knows where to connect all the dots. Otherwise, it's like, I don't know where to. So you're just <laughs> specifying what groups to be connecting the lines with. Color, so color it based on whether it's a top or bottom uh, or other. Uh, and then set the alpha to also be top or bottom. Um, and then we go into the scale coloring. So this is where he's actually defining the colors used in the plot for the lines. He's using this uh, pound FFC, um, which I'm assuming is yellow. Uh, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yep, because then he's got the gray and the black one. Yes, and then dark gray would be the other, and mm -hmm. then black would be the uh, bottom five countries. Now he's also now going to be scaling the alpha with scale alpha manual, and it's also going to follow a similar pattern ones for the top and the bottom countries uh and then 0.6 for the um other countries scale uh x date which is going to set the the x uh axes he wants it to limit between um the year 2000 and the year 2023 because he wants to have he's manually forcing the plot to be wider than the data that he has and this is uh for the label he's going to be adding and uh the further down on the plot here. Sets his labels, the title is Big Mac Index, subtitle, defining what the actual viz is, X is setting to year, Y is to the dollar price, print US dollars, and now he's adding these annotations here. And so when you look at the plot, let's bring this up real quick. These annotations he's adding right here, are, oh, so I guess I flipped the, the logic there. So these are, yeah, the bottom fives were yellow. The yeah, top when, five. Yeah, when you, um, in scale man, uh, color manual, it's going to do it in alphabetical order. So bottom, uh, so so it's uh, what did he call it? Yeah, bottom uh, five. Obviously, B yeah. is going to come before, right? So mm -hmm. 
it's it's you not can also define the order you, you can he, to show up so you could actually within that values um yep yeah, right there you could actually just type in like um top five equals hashtag ff you know so pound yeah. ffc and then you know what you could define them if you don't define them just know that it's going to happen um oh. alphabetically automatically yeah gotcha yeah. Um, so yeah. So now he's going to annotate his uh, plot there with the actual top and bottom five countries. Um, so this is what happens here. So he's annotating with text. The X location that he wants to place them is all uh, 2020 in September, because the X axis is a date. That's why he'd use that. Uh, the Y axis, he's he I'm guessing figured pulled out the actual positions or visually kind of jiggled them around a little bit to make it sure so they didn't overlap but you can still see the order um, there there is a way to do it i think you'd, you'd need a little bit more code in your mutate to highlight the final date for each country and uh you can put a like um uh geom uh geom label mm. at the final date as the x and it'll it'll put that actual like box label or geom text it'll put the text right there at the end mm, yeah if you do it with annotate, you have to kind of like print it, bump the numbers around and shift. Yeah, exactly. It's so, a little fiddly. Yeah, yeah. You got to move it around. You have to be very explicit on where you want it. Mm -hmm. but yeah, so these these are adding the, the text labels on the far right side there. He's going to set the theme to be classic so that it's a, a default theme there. And then he's going to add his own um, theming to this. Where the legend position is none, we don't want a label because we don't need that in this situation here. Setting the text by default to be the Helvetica family using bold and the yellow uh, coloring there. The plot background, he's setting to be uh, a fill of the red color. Same with the panel background. So by setting both of those, it's going to be wholly red in the background. Um, plot title, he's setting the size to be a rel relative point. 1.8. So rel we haven't seen in the past. Yeah. Uh, I don't really use rel. I just usually set set the actual value. But rel yeah. is used to yeah. specify sizes relative to the parent. Interesting. I've never so used that before. That's pretty cool. Never yeah, seen that's that pretty cool. Before. Yeah. So rather than setting a geom text size size DT, equals 20 or yeah, exactly. Uh, this will be relative. So as it scales up, it will. Yeah. I think it'll grow with it, which you know, that's pretty sweet. Um, so yeah. Axis dot line. So setting the axes and grid panels lines to be that yellow color that we saw earlier. Setting the grid uh, major lines to be a dashed line, um, and the axis dot text element text be yellow and a si slightly larger at one point zero five, and the axis title to be larger at one point two. So everything's kind oh, of relative. I wonder if um, if you use that rel on a GG plot inside of Shiny. I wonder if the titles and labels will, if it's inside Shiny. You know, that way yeah. someone working on like a laptop then to a bigger screen on a desktop. I wonder if it'll resize automatically. Because if obviously in Shiny, if I set my, you know, plot title to equal 20, no matter what kind of screen you're looking on, the Shiny will resize, but the plot title stays yeah, I think it also, right? also wonder... will depend on the size of the actual plot. Maybe, window yeah. For yeah, the that... plot the like shiny output. Oh, but okay, yeah. Huh. Maybe. I don't know. We can look into that. That should be fun. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. All right, cool. So we've got his plot here. Now we're going to print it. Oh, I think you what forgot to run the function. I think you forgot his function. In it. Uh, oh, yeah. because I didn't, I didn't define his infix operator. There we yeah, go. Yeah, that's what it is. There you go. My bad. So here's his plot. Boom. Yay. It's amazing. Look at that viz. Yeah, so we're super uh, excited about the, the viz here. I, we think it looks like a lot of fun. Um, it, it's pretty jaunty. It's colorful. I mean, like McDonald's intended their colors to be. <laughs> uh, yeah. And yeah, it was pretty clever. I thought it was a, a good show of, you know, really working on your theming, coming up with a custom function for your infix operator to kind of be yeah. a little bit clever with that. Um, and then he uses a GG save at the end there. Um, he's going to set it to be a PDF and he's defining his height width in units. And that's going to make the nicer image that you actually saw on Twitter. Because uh, you can see here, it's a little, little bit choppy and that's just the, um, the quick visualization, essentially, that RStudio is showing us. 
um, yeah. that when you're saving it to PDF, it'll be smoother lines. Uh, he did want to mention also, as you can see here, the visualization is a little, um, not dull, but it's, it's pretty all vibrant. And the uh, plot that he created has is lighter in the middle here and darker on the edge, and he threw it through an Instagram filter, uh, which is also pretty cool. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think you, you could also probably figure out how to do that with R. Um, but just wanted to bring that up, so it's not going to look identical. But I think for the most pretty darn close. We got yeah. we got all basically there. Yeah. Thank you so much, Peter, for letting us yeah. go and explain your code, explain how it all worked. Thought it was thought it was a lot of fun to to put this together. Yeah, super cool. Really liked it. All right, so now I'm going to restart uh, my R session, and Pat, you can kind of tell us what we're going to be working on next. Yeah, so uh, continuing on from last week, uh, where we started to kind of get a little more into Plotly, I decided why don't we keep expanding our world of Plotly, since um, it's something that we've only used sparingly, and we've done a lot of GG plot. so let's kind of move and grow. That's what the screencast is about. Yeah. And so I decided to pull in some hockey data since we're um, about to embark on a new hockey season. And next year we'll have our own team. I got my, um, my Kraken hat on there, support yes. the locals. So uh, I got to get one of those. Uh, so I grew up in Cleveland, so we didn't have a lot of hockey when I was a kid. Uh, the Columbus team wasn't there yet. So um, I've never really had a team and I've never really had a lot of time sitting down and watching the sport. So I'm going to start to do more hockey analysis as a way of learning about mm -hmm. the sport and yeah, things so. like that. So we're yeah. going to start on with some hockey data. We'll load in our packages, um, the usual suspects, Tidyverse, uh, Plotly and Shiny, because we're going to build a Shiny app as well with Plotly embedded into it. And then our vest is how we're going to uh, get the data. We'll be using um, hockey reference. Yep. And then a little z-score function. We've used this before. This is going to be just used to normalize our data. So we've we've done that many times. And we're going to go into hockeyreference.com. Uh, we've used the reference.coms before, basketball, baseball, and football. Um, Hockey Reference is another amazing site with just tons of data Trashy for gross. you. And it's uber easy to access the tables with uh, the RVest package. Do you want to uh, step through what we got for our web scrape here? Sure thing. All right, so this is the URL that we're going to be using. It's a 2020 uh, NHL uh, data set that we're uh, going to be pulling here on the, the players for that year. Uh, I like to uh, try to try to minimize the number of times I'm hitting their servers because it just slows things down. Every time I'm hitting it, I have to wait for a response. So if I'm reading their HTML, I try to save that initially into a separate uh, object as I'm kind of iterating over it. So now we've got this hockey HTML data set here. So the hockey URL, we're going to feed that into read HTML. That's what happened with that. Next, we're going to pull out the actual table that we want to pull uh, to get all the data from. Um, so we're going to take that hockey HTML data set, throw it into an HTML node, say I want the table um, node from there, and then use HTML table to convert it from an HTML table into an actual data frame that we can use in R uh, with the rest of our normal uh, functions. Next, I'm going to use this set names function here because not every column from each the HTML table actually had a column name. And so by defining it with set names one to end call period, it's going to give a name to every column, but it's going to be one, two, three through number of columns yeah. there. So it's kind of <laughs> knocking away the column names, but I think... And this is something pretty standard on the sports reference websites is they'll have um, double column names where it might be like offense and then that might span five columns and it says like points, assists, you know, passes, blah, 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 and then they'll have defense. So it's just something to be aware of. Yeah. Those. yeah. HTML is a little bit more flexible and allows for more things to happen than our data frame objects would expect each column to be named. You can't span columns. You can't do that. That's not, yeah. that's not a thing for us in, in yeah. R. Uh, so next we're going to take the hockey table uh, that now that we have, we actually know which columns we want, which are columns two, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, we're going to pull those out and we're going to rename them because uh, column now the new column one is the player. Uh, we're going to rename um, column two to be position, column three to be names, column four to be goals, and column five to be assists. 
and pull that out so just so that we can kind of show you what it looks like here. Oh, there we go. Player, pose, uh, position, games, goals, assists. All right, so now we're going to filter a player to keep only the rows where it is an actual player. So another thing with the reference websites is they repeat the column headers going through, which is great when you're looking at the website, but for our purposes, we don't need that. So we're going to filter out that player, and then we're going to go through and start summarizing and grouping by, because uh, sometimes a player could be listed multiple times. They might have played for multiple teams, multiple positions, and they were separated out in the table. We don't want that. So we're going to group by player. We're going to use a summarize function to then reduce, re reduce so each player only has a single row. Uh, we're going to add together all the um, stats that we kept on. So games, scores, and assists. We're going to go across all these columns, so games to assists, and we're going to add them all together. We're going to use this as.numeric to convert any character values into numeric because some on a character value, it throws warnings and errors and doesn't want to do it, which makes sense. Which is the other thing on those hockey or those sports reference sites is when you pull the data in, all columns will be in character format. So yes, just to be aware. Yes, exactly. Um, then we're gonna go and okay, define position to be what position did they play the most? Um, so if they if they did happen to play multiple positions, and so we're defining that as pose, which max games. Then we're going to create a custom string to show us what are all the positions they played and how many games did they play and how many shots did they take or how many scores did they make, excuse me, with goals and the number of assists that they had and collapse it all together into a longer string. And then we're going to use this dot groups equals drop feature, uh, which is relatively new. It came out, I think, earlier this year um, where in Summarize, because there was a lot of grief and confusion around when summarize is going to be dropping the group by when it keeps the drop by and the tr the historical way that it did that is it always drop off the very last group by variable so you could kind of build up your data set that way at least that was the theory but evidently not not, not enough of us picked up on that and so we we're always like well, what how, what am i supposed to be doing i gotta always call it on group afterwards this is so annoying um and so earlier this year they added this dot groups feature where you can define how you want the grouping to continue through, whether you want to keep all of them, uh, whether you want to drop all your grouping after the summarize, when you want to drop the last feature. Um, it's, I believe it's fairly flexible, but I think that this is a pretty, pretty cool thing uh, to start adding into your code. Yeah. So you don't Pro have to use an ungroup afterwards. Probably something to just get in the habit of doing all the time. Exactly. Right. Um, so then we're going to also filter to keep, any players that played less than 27 games out of this data set because we're going to be normal be normalizing it we don't want a player that played in one game scored 10 times and, and totally skew which would be amazing that'd be like <laughs> bravo yeah. um so yeah we're gonna we're gonna remove all those and then we're gonna do a mutate to add z scores to it so this is normalizing the value so we're gonna call our z score function on assists and Z score on goals and assign to assists underscore Z and goals underscore Z. Um, and then just to double check, make sure uh, that we only have a single row per player, we're gonna call distinct. Yep. Um, and that is gonna say, okay, drop any duplicate rows uh, based on player and the dot keep all will say, okay, now keep all the columns though still. Because normally by default, distinct will only keep the column that you defined call distinct on. Distinct on. Yep. So we will run this. So now we've got a, a tibble that has 630 rows. Each player is represented once. We have goals, games, assists, position, positions with some details around uh, the positions that they played. Yeah, was there anybody that played multiple positions? Like in basketball, you you know, We'd have guys that played two, three, sometimes positions uh, when we do the uh, basketball reference stuff. But I wonder. Uh, it doesn't look like it usually. No. Uh, I, I think everybody was. Um, let's add a REPL for a my separator between those. Yeah. Positions. No. It doesn't look like it. So. 
I guess, and maybe hockey people can uh, help us out, correct us if we're wrong. I guess is it that players play in hockey, the position that they play, they kind of – they don't move they around. Play. Yeah, maybe they're just yeah. super defined, I guess. I don't know. Let us know, uh, hockey watchers. Hockey watchers, yeah. Okay. Hockey, hockey knowledge people. Yeah. Um, so then here's just a quick head of the data set, even though we just looked at it. And now we're going to get into Plotly. Hey. You want to take us through this one? Yeah. So last week we did the baseball plotly with the uh, pitches, and um, and that was cool. It was like a, a nice little plotly where you could click and get some information, and it had a tool tip. Uh, and so this week I wanted to kind of continue on with that idea and theme with our normalized goals and assists, but I wanted the plot to also be interactive, where the user had the ability to um, get the you know, type in a player that they might be interested in and see where they are relative to the group or click on a player within the group that looked interesting and, and um, uh, get some information about them. So the first thing I did was I created this little player search uh, variable with the highlight key. This is going to be the player that's going to be highlighted. So we take our NHL data and we are going to highlight by tilde player there. So we get that player search variable, and then we're just going to create the basic plot. So the first thing uh, uh, is just creating the plot and getting kind of the canvas set. So we do this with Plotly. Um, we're going to use the highlight, that player search highlight thingy there, and uh, we're going to color all of the points as black. Then we're going to group by player, and we're going to add some markers. So these are going to be the points. We're going to have... Um, uh, X on um, X axis is our uh, standardized assists, and on the Y axis is our standardized goals. We're going to set our marker size to be 10. We want the symbols to change based on the position that the person played. And then I created this um, custom tooltip. So rather than it just giving us the standardized X and Y coordinate of the point, I wanted it to give us some useful information because standardized values don't help us interpret. The, uh, the raw data, and it also doesn't tell us the name of the person or maybe even what position they play. So we put in some information on this uh, standard tooltip, um, uh, player, goals, and then assists, and we use a little bit of HTML to put the breaks so that it doesn't come out all in one long string. So basically we get kind of a, a tooltip that's lined vertically. Yeah. So it looks looks nice there, and then we're also looks, yeah. we are going to pass the uh, standardized values, but just as a paren, just like oh BT dubs, this is the value here. C correct, yeah, the uh, underlying values. But it, you know, we really what we were caring about is this, and we wanted to be able to compare them accurately. Yeah, um, and then the layout is just obviously the info about how we want to set our titles and set our x axis and our y axis. So if we just ran that alone. Uh, without running the next part, yeah, yeah. we're going to get the plot. So this is what the sort of base plot looks like. You can hover over and see. You can do all your typical plotly stuff like highlighting in on one region. Um, yeah, obviously, yeah, clicking on a player, highlight and drag, all that stuff. But we want this to be interactive where the user has control over selecting the players of interest. So we use this highlight function and we pass our plot in. And we want players to be highlighted based on the Plotly click. So when we click on them, and then we set the, uh, the variables there to be true, which help us um, like keep and retain players, or if we double click, reset everything, um, which players we're selecting. There's going to be a selectize box at the top, those kinds of things. So it's a dynamic plot that now we could go up to the top and we could type in a player name if we wanted to or use the drop down and select where that player is. And then we get some information there as far as who we've selected. If we were consistent, like, so that person is a center. So let's say we wanted to know um, how they were relative to all the centers. We could double click on the, yeah, there we go. Center position. And we could, we could select players in there. So you could, if you wanted to, exactly, you could type names or select players. See, they're, they're popping up here too. And they're popping play. up at the top. Yeah. So that's, that's what's keeping the, that select dies equals true. It's keeping those players up at the top. You could change the colors. Yeah. So if you wanted to create a different group of players. So yeah. Boom, there you go. So it's pretty cool. So I thought, okay, but well, that's pretty fun and uh, exciting. 
now let's make a shiny app and try and extend it a little bit further because maybe there's information in the table in like a table that we would also want. So like, as we select a player, maybe we want to get information. Obviously here we have only games and, and goals and assists. Maybe we'd have things like salary information, like how much per year they cost, like age, age, um, injuries, like all kinds of information that might provide more context. Uh, as we're like building our roster, or evaluating players or comparing two players, things like that. So um, we built this really simple shiny app. Um, I didn't even use any crazy like table function or like like DT or GT or format table. I literally used the the base table output. So the UI is probably the easiest UI I've ever written. It's literally just the the two outputs. The magic of this one is going to be in the server where we're using reactive values to basically say, hey, when we click on a player, do something else down here to the table. So why don't we run the UI? Yeah. Oh, by the way, if you want to learn more about Shiny Apps, we did do a series on building up a Shiny App uh, yeah. to recreate the 538 Carmelo uh, application that they have. Uh, so we will provide a link down below for if you yeah. want to learn more because we're not going to cover the super ba- we're not going to cover the basics in this one. Go to that video and that series. Yeah, Th- this video is about embedding Plotly into your Shiny app. So um, do you want to uh, go through and explain a bit of the server that we we wrote here? For sure. So server is a function that we use. It's got input, output, and session. These are just standard things you need to be setting up for your Shiny app. It's used by pieces of the Shiny app uh, further back, but we're not going to worry about that. Um, what we've got here is we're going to use, first we're going to add the Plotly into it, which is basically identical to what we had before. Uh, We are gonna do some minor tweaks to this where we're gonna take the NHL data set that we have. Uh, We're gonna be mutating and adding a field called player color where if the player is one of the players that we click on, which we'll cover how you find that out later on, color it to be red. Otherwise the player should be gray. And now we've got this new highlighted players data set here. Uh, This was for some debugging. So we're not going to worry about that. We were just filtering to make sure that uh, we were actually coloring the correct player. Uh, Next, we're going to throw it into our Plotly. Very similar to what we had before. We're adding a trace. The mode is markers. That is basically the same as add markers. uh, What we were using before. X-axis is assist Z. Y is still goal Z. Uh, We're now going to set the color to be the identity, which is that I there of the player color value that we're passing to it. Otherwise, Plotly is going to try to assign a color based on the string that we we selected. No, we actually want red or gray. So that's what the I does there. And then we're going to use this argument custom data. Um, and this is once again going to be used later on. And we're going to use the value player, which is you know the player name. We're going to set the symbol to be position. The identical hover template that we were showing before, it's just now kind of strung out a little bit more where it's player. Uh, each team, uh, string break, goals, their uh, standardized goals, the assists, and then the standardized uh, assists. Use the identi- uh, identical uh, layout where the title is the NHL goals and assists. Uh, X axis is assists, Y axis is goals. So now we've got, so this is all the code that's going inside of this render plotly object. So anytime uh, selected players updates, it'll regenerate this plotly for us. Um, and then outputs to the PLT um, field here, which is the Plotly outlet in our UI. So now we've got our Plotly existing. Now we want to make it so that we can interact with anything that we click in our Plotly and use it later on to create our table. Um, So first thing we need to do is we need to have an object that's going to store what we've clicked on in the past and so we're going to use this selected players object to store that it is uh, what is known as a reactive value or reactive val um, object here so we just assign that and so now we basically have an object that we can share across everything and it'll store these values or we can assign over it there's a whole bunch we can do with it Um, so then we've got a series of these observe events pat you want to take us through these yeah, so the observe event is just uh, looking at what we clicked on and basically, in this case, the person that we clicked on and adding them to a list, to a vector of all the players that have been clicked on previously, right? So um, within this observe event, we're observing the event called Plotly Click. Obviously, we're going to click on the player that we want. The new selected uh, variable is going to be 
um, that custom data. So the player that we've just clicked on right there. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then um, all players selected is going to be a vector where we concatenate uh, any selected players that are sitting in that reactive val, as well as anyone that's newly selected. This is going to be so that we can click on uh, multiple players at a time and have them get deposited into a table again. So if we wanted to like compare some players or things like that. And then uh, the final uh, piece of the observe event is the selected players. We're getting the unique uh, names of all of those players in the vector. So if there's like doubled up or anything like mm -hmm. that. And then the, the unique thing about reactive val is you don't use a arrow assignment to update the value. You actually use it kind of like a, a weird function where you selected players paren the new value that we want to be adding to it. So it's kind of like a little funky, but uh, this is this is how we're assigning now the list or the the vector of all the players that we've selected through our plot lane. Yeah. And then we do, oh, so this is here is uh, we're going to observe a second event. So this event is if, uh, like if Ellis happens to double click the plot, it's just going to dump everybody off of that table and reset the plot back to the original color. All players are, uh, no, no players are selected, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, a, this is essentially our clear all option, right? With the double click. And then we finish by outputting the table. So we're going to render the table. We're going to use that NHL data set that we have created, and we're going to filter by that vector of selected players. So those are the players that we selected. So anytime we select a player, this, this uh, render table function is going to say, hey, find, take the NHL data, filter out the player that they've selected, and obviously those are the, the columns that are going to get deposited to the table. Basically, it's all of the columns except the two standardized um, goals and assists values at the end. I just drop those and I said, we don't need to see those. We just want to see the raw data. So whenever someone clicks on a value, uh, clicks on a player, find that player and just dump his name into the table. Yep. So there you go. So now we've got our shiny logic or the server back in logic going. Um, so that way we can kind of get some cross reactivity between our plot and the table. So now we're going to generate our server function and throw it into shiny app and the shiny app function which takes the ui in, in server and it's thinking and here's our oh. shiny app all right so have, say we want to click on david pasternak we wanted to know more about him we see some high level information about the goals and assists that he has but what if we wanted to know position i guess we have that, uh, more information about it than um uh, yeah, the don't. table could be as long as we wanted. We could do this with DT and make it sortable, things like that. So yeah. now we have David Pasternak, and he plays right wing, and there's two right wings that had more assists than him right there just below where he's at. So maybe we want to say, like, oh, who are these guys? So we can dump them in and also oh. get information on them. Again, the information in the table isn't particularly exciting compared to what we can see from the plot. Um it's more there conceptually that like if we were to build in other information, um, we could turn this into a pretty useful web app that could tell us a lot about a player, their status, and, you know, maybe have some projections and all forecasts and all kinds of things about the player if we yeah. wanted to. Yeah. So it's, it's exactly like a normal plot. You can click around on things, but say, Oh shoot, I clicked on, on somebody and I don't, I don't want them there anymore. Well, you double click and it resets it. Yeah, and if you do by position, so if you click like the centers, double click, uh, and then you can click on players within the centers. So, oh, so now, it regenerates the the plot. Yeah. So I wonder, can you click on centers again though? What if you hold down Shift and then click? Oh, I thought it would hold. So I think, okay. I, yeah, I think it's because the the shiny or the the plotly is going to be totally rebuilt every time. Yeah. That we select a new one. So there's there is a way. I'm sure so we would can... need to like maybe have some sort of if statement, like if positions are clicked, hold the data. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure there's a way to do this. But, yeah, we'd have we to wanted to out. conceptually show you like highlight. We didn't want to get into a lot of details and yeah. getting fiddly yeah. with all the stuff. We wanted to show you y'all conceptually how you could build this up. And then yeah. it's up to you to go through and have some fun playing around with Plotly and, and tables and Shiny and 
getting all the pieces to work exactly how you want them to. Yeah. But yeah, so there cool. we go. But that was a lot of fun to put together. Hopefully y'all learned a little bit more about Plotly, learned more about highlighting values, um, creating cool themes, shiny, all the above. <laughs> R. Yeah. yeah. It's episode 42. We're solving the universe. Yes, exactly. Solving the hockey universe. Yes, exactly. So hopefully we'll have more hockey uh, data and more interesting things to look at than assist singles uh, in, in the future. Yes, yeah, sounds perfect. Alrighty. Mm-hmm. So I think with that, we will call it. So thank you all for joining us. Let us know what you thought of this video in comments below or tag us on Twitter and tell us, hey, you guys are doing an awesome job because we really appreciate hearing from y'all. Uh, my name is Ellis Hughes. You can find me on Twitter at Ellis underscore Hughes. And I'm Patrick Ward. You can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick. And if you want to tag us on Twitter, it's at tidy underscore explained, or uh, you could email us tidy.explained at gmail.com. All right. With that, keep on exploring your world. <laughs> <laughs>